Hello and welcome. i uh, Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we're looking at haponatremia, its classification, clinical presentation, pathophysiology and causes. I have looked at the guidelines produced by North Bristol NHS Trust and Royal United Hospital Spas NHS Trust, as well as other guidance focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. The links to the sources consulted are in the episode description. The next video will be on the further assessment and management of hyponatremia, so make sure not to miss it. Right, without further ado, let's get started. Hyponatremia tends to be more common in the elderly, in patients admitted to hospital, in those with history of alcohol excess, and in patients treated with tarsite diuretics. It is associated with complications such as seizures and increased mortality, and the risk increases with the severity of hyponatremia. So, starting with the basics, what is hyponatremia? Well, the normal range of sodium is from 135 to 145 millimoles per litre. So, hyponatremia, that is a low sodium, is when the sodium is below 135. However, guidelines in North Bristol and Bath define it as a sodium below 133 so we should always look at our local path lab reference range. The severity of hyponatremia can be classified into mild, moderate and severe. NICE recommends the following thresholds. Mild is when the sodium is between 130 and 135. Moderate is when the sodium is between 125 and 129. And severe is when the sodium is below 125. However, other guidelines give different thresholds, for example, in Bath, severe hyponatremia is below 120, and in North Bristol, it's below 115. But, from a primary care perspective, it would be better to err on the side of caution, so we will stick to 125. This is very important for us, because we are advised to admit hospital patients with severe hyponatremia, as well as those who are symptomatic, irrespective of the sodium levels. And what are the symptoms of hyponatremia? The primary symptoms are due to cellular swelling, particularly in the brain, because of the osmotic movement of water into the cells in response to the low sodium. The brain is particularly sensitive to changes in osmolality, and when sodium levels drop, extracellular osmolality also decreases, leading to water moving into brain tissue and leading to a degree of cerebral edema. This is responsible for most of the clinical manifestations of hyponatremia, like cognitive decline, headaches, confusion, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, agitation, seizures, and eventually coma and cardiorespiratory arrest. Other potential symptoms are connected to the musculoskeletal system, given that a low sodium also leads to impaired neuromuscular transmission causing cramps, weakness and fatigue. The severity of the symptoms will not only depend on the severity of the hyponatremia, but also on the rate of onset. So, on this basis, hyponatremia can be classified as chronic, when it develops gradually over time, and certainly over more than 48 hours. Mild chronic hyponatremia can be asymptomatic or present with mild nonspecific symptoms. On the other hand, acute hyponatremia is when the sodium level has fallen by more than 10 millimoles per litre in less than 48 hours, and it is a medical emergency, given that it is associated with a high mortality and morbidity. Acute hyponatremia is rare and most often due to marked water intake, such as with post-operative fluids, ecstasy use, marathon runners or psychogenic polydipsia. Finally, we should also describe two other concepts, pseudo and hypertonic hyponatremia. In pseudo we are talking about a path lab artifact. It is caused by an increased concentration of non-aqueous components in plasma, such as, for example, high triglycerides or very high proteins like in paraproteinemia. The sodium concentration is normal, but the measured value is falsely low due to the dilution effect in the path lab assay. So it has no clinical significance and the patient will be asymptomatic from that point of view. 
On the other hand, in hypertonic hyponatremia, there is true hyponatremia, which is caused by an osmotic substance, commonly glucose, in cases of significant hyperglycemia, which draws water from the intracellular to the extracellular compartment, causing a true dilutional hyponatremia. There may be symptoms of hyperglycemia, for example polyuria, polydipsia and dehydration, and although there may be some hyponatremia-related symptoms, it does not really cause cerebral edema because plasma has a high osmolality secondary to the hyperglycemia. Let's now have a look at the causes of hyponatremia, but perhaps before doing so, let's have a quick look at sodium metabolism and homeostasis. Most sodium is obtained through dietary intake, mostly from salt, and absorption occurs primarily in the small intestine. Sodium can be lost through sweat and in smaller amounts via feces, but these mechanisms are less significant compared to renal regulation, which plays a major role in sodium balance by filtering sodium in the glomeruli and reabsorbing it under the influence of certain hormones. Let's look at this hormonal control. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is stimulated by hypovolemia and low sodium. It increases aldosterone, which enhances renal sodium reabsorption. The antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, causes water retention and it indirectly influences sodium concentration because it can lead to dilution or hyponatremia. And finally, the natriuretic peptides are released in response to high blood pressure or high blood volume, and, as the name indicates, they promote natriuresis by inhibiting renal sodium reabsorption. So, the pathophysiology of hyponatremia can result from excess water retention or sodium loss. And we can also differentiate the causes according to fluid status. In hypovolemia, there is generally a loss of both fluid and sodium, with the loss of sodium being greater relative to water. Examples are acute kidney injury, other renal diseases, diuretics, Addison's disease, and significant vomiting and or diarrhea. Hypervolemia is often seen in conditions where edema is a feature. Fluid lost into the institutional tissues is detected by the body as a loss of intravascular fluid and excess fluid is retained as a compensatory mechanism. Although generally both aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone are stimulated, there is a disproportionate retention of water relative to sodium, giving rise to dilutional hyponatremia. Examples are congested cardiac failure, chronic liver disease and nephrotic syndrome. In euvolemic hyponatremia, the issue is typically increased water retention without significant changes in intravascular volume. Sodium loss is not prominent, and while overall sodium content is normal, excess water causes dilutional hyponatremia. Examples include medications like thyroid diuretics, ACE inhibitors, antidepressants, antipileptics, or proton pump inhibitors. Other causes include the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, hypothyroidism, and psychogenic polydipsia. Additional causes are very low salt intake, although rare, and reset osmostat syndrome. Now, given that we're here, let's have a look at reset osmostat in a little bit more detail. Reset osmostat refers to a condition where the body's regulation of serum sodium is altered such that the set point for plasma osmolality and sodium is lower than normal. In this situation, the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, which regulate thirst and antidiuretic hormone, function normally, but are set at a lower than normal threshold. A reset osmostat is often seen in conditions associated with chronic illnesses, where long-term adaptation to the lower sodium happens. Examples include chronic malnutrition, chronic heart failure or chronic liver disease, like cirrhosis, and advanced age. Key features of a reset osmostat are stable mild hyponatremia, appropriate ADH response, no water retention issues, and normal response to fluid challenges. 
every set osmostat is an important condition to recognize because it represents a benign and adaptive form of hyponatremia. Unlike other causes which can lead to complications, patients with a reset osmostat often do not require aggressive treatment, and treatment to raise sodium levels could potentially lead to harm. So that is it, an introduction to hyponatremia relevant to primary care. Remember that the next video will be on the further assessment and management of hyponatremia, so make sure not to miss it. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.